Hi, and welcome to another episode of Red Talks. And with me today, I have two guests. I have two guests from WWT. We're going to be talking about the artist formerly known as Clicker. Now Cisco's Cloud Connect. Did I get no Cloud Center? How dare I get that wrong? Um, and with me, I have Mark Wall, who's joined us once before. Say hello, Mark. Hi, everybody. Good to see you again. And we have a new guest, Joe Weber, who's been doing lots of really cool things with Cisco Cloud Center. Hey, how's it going? So thanks both for joining us. We're going to um, we're going to talk about uh, automating automating a number of technologies actually um, with Cloud Center. But first, we're just going to explain a bit more about um, automation and just what you guys have been doing in that space. And you know, you got some nice diagrams that help explain what what's been going on, etc. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, just, just how's life in automation land? Like, what's going on with you guys? So uh, we we see automation, and a lot of the customers in the industry as well sees automation as a, a kind of the newest wave inside of I would say IT, the the way to get more efficiency and to to gain some customization of their their overall platform to run their business. Uh, a key driving force behind that is automation. Cool and. It's growing in popularity. People, people are doing stuff, or they're still just talking about it these days. I think there's a there's probably a growing trend where where people are now realizing that in order to be successful and to be able to agile and be able to move fast, uh, they're going to have to the level of automation inside of their own uh, you know architecture and environment. Otherwise, they're going to be left in the dust by by the the smaller, maybe more agile companies, maybe the newer companies that are out there that are really even a lot of the larger companies right now. Yeah. So, sorry, Mark, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going kind to of, to reiterate, you know, what Joe was saying. We're seeing a lot of different groups, whether it's sort of the network group, uh, more of the security group, or the application delivery group, starting to sort of tinker with automation and develop um, kind of their own, own way of doing things to kind of drive that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to sort of help customers um, not only get, you know, go from zero to one to two, but also look at an overall sort of vision and sort of integrate these different teams and sort of build that in um, in some different workflows and things, which I think Joe will uh, will mention later. So that's starting to become much more relevant as well. That's interesting that you just said there, the whole zero to one to two. I mean, I think a lot of people think that they have to try and achieve all these things in one go and fully automate everything. And that's, that's really unrealistic. I mean, a lot of times it's actually just first getting comfortable with just working yourself through APIs and not using a CLI before you start getting into these full tool chains. Um, however, I guess on the flip side, what is lucky for many people is that they've got guys like yourselves who have built out these things and understand how they work and can help people on that journey, getting from that first step through to, to you know what, let's cut out several days worth of work and just make that into a button, a repeatable ops process that, uh, that can be uh, run again and again. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, you said a very important point there too when, when you talk about process because a lot of this is really around the process. Um, the, the reason that you do automation and the reason that you're doing that is to is to minimize the time that a process takes internally to, to get something, to deliver something to, to the end user or to the customer. So the, the process is, is probably the most important piece of any kind of automation strategy is figuring out the correct process and where automation fits in to reduce the time to, time to value. Yeah, I think when, when Mark and I spoke last, actually, that was a, a lot of the conversation we had was that um, it's, it's less exciting to the people who want to do the scripting, but if you don't sit down first and map the business process, where do you start? What do you start automating? What, what parts of the pipeline can be taken away from the keyboard and turned into a, a playbook or a, a cookbook or whatever product you might be using to, to, to accelerate that along? And I think... Um, I'm definitely guilty of that. I like to jump straight in and just see what I can do with some Node or some, some Python. And then after a few hours of that, I realized, what, what, why, why did I go down that path? <laughs> like, what, what was I doing? I should have just started with a whiteboard and then, and then gone down after that and, uh, and been much more effective. And I think, there's some, I think there are some, uh, uh, some commercial off-the-shelf products now that lend itself to a platform to support these types of automation, orchestration, and DevOps. Uh, uh, methodologies that people are trying to put in place at, at the different organizations that they work. And I think that that's really helped driving the adoption of automation 
as the fundamental uh, task by task based uh, thing that you need to do to drive orchestration to furthermore enable them to have their own quote unquote automated cloud per se or our automated DevOps uh, uh, processes. So I think that's that's a lot of the pieces of this is now there are some products so that the customer doesn't have to start at a Python uh, command prompt, right? To start building up their, their platform. Yeah, totally, totally. Now you, I think there are some, some diagrams and a bit of a, a process you could share with us to sort of show how you communicate these things and the solution that you've been working on. Um, do you want to jump to that part? Yeah, I, maybe before we jump in there, maybe I can I can jump through a couple slides here uh, uh, with you guys. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, please do. You can see my screen. We want. I kind of like to put out a couple uh, key definitions when when we talk to customers. Um, really, automation is, is kind of a single task. Uh, you're you're launching a web server or you're you're configuring a a, a virtual IP address on on an F5 or or you're configuring a VLAN for a specific switch. An orchestration is really concerned, and it's really talking about taking multiple steps or, or multiple uh, single tasks or automations and stringing them together. I usually talk about it that is that's more that one plus one equals three fuzzy math that orchestration provides you. Instead of having to click every single time to run a task, you string tasks together, you orchestrate some uh, uh, bigger process and uh, automation, uh, generally speaking. Now, if you look at both automation and orchestration, in order to, to have a cloud-like environment, something that seems, quote, unquote, cloud-like, and cloud has many terms, but uh, to have that, you need to have some sort of um, automation orchestration. Because what essentially you're trying to do is provide services in an automated fashion to the end user. And the most, most of the time in a cloud, the end user is actually the application owners or the developers. So uh, kind of moving forward, there's a couple other terms that you may hear out in the industry. Some of them is one of the one of the terms is mode one versus mode two. Uh, I kind of sometimes we consider them pets versus livestock. Uh, and kind of the analogy is is a, a mode one uh, application is something that you sit there, you care and feed, and 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 you really care about. It's uh, more uh, maintenance intensive, and and it's something you want to bring up. I kind of consider a lot of like uh, email. Uh, maybe maybe Microsoft Exchange would be a, a mode one application. And then if you go look over on the right where we talk about livestock, uh, mode two, that's more the, uh, uh, you, you, I wouldn't say you care less, but you care a lot less about them. So you have the ability to spin them up, spin them down, um, get rid of them uh, at will, and it's not really going to affect the overall application per se. And the ability to recreate uh, in a very cookie cutter fashion that application, to reinstantiate that application, uh, uh, is also an important piece. To include also uh, some terms around microservices, which is running a service, just a single service, and maybe inside of a containerized environment. So just just going back to back one there, um, Joe. This is something this comes up a lot when I when I talk to people. I think there's a general confusion in the industry that. Mode two and DevOps are the same thing, whereas actually mode one and mode two are, are architectures and DevOps um, is a practice. So that is cross-team collaboration to achieve a more automated pipeline. Now, what, what I think it, it's getting a little lost in some of the marketing stuff out there is the fact that actually DevOps functions really, really well in mode one. It just means not doing everything manually. It can still be a continuous deployment pipeline. You just might not have gone into a very lightweight microservice type architecture. And I think there's, there's quite a bit of confusion out there that, that both the DevOps and Mode 2 are interchangeable terms when really they're, actually, they're not. They're very different. One's a, one's a practice, one's an architecture. Yeah, I agree. I think one's way more the uh, kind of an operating model or process model that you're, you've instituted, that being DevOps. Um, and, and I think mode two lends itself very, very easily to the DevOps model. Not to say that you couldn't do that with mode one, though, as well. So, Joe, so I agree with you. From real, real quick on that, where are, where are you seeing customers sort of, sort of, um, you know, where are they today and sort of, and sort of moving towards? Do you see it is more of a drive in kind of the mode two? Is it kind of the DevOps? What what is usually that just that high level conversation that that drives to where? Um, you know, with your customer meetings and everything to drive a lot of these discussions and architectures? A lot of customers, they, they really want to start at, uh, to, to be quite frank, a lot of them, 
have heard the industry terms, you know, mode one, mode two, but where they really want to start is how do we automate our current processes um, before we talk about this architecture of mode one, mode two, how do we actually automate our current architecture so we get more efficient? Uh, that's where actually a lot of customers are starting in this whole overall cloud slash DevOps journey that, that a lot of our uh, customers are trying to embark upon. And, and that's, that's one critical piece here is that the, the Well, I think we we lost a little audio there from Joe. Yep, yeah, must be a solar flare. Well, I think like why is one broadcast? And I think automation is actually one that the, the automation and on top of that orchestration are things that are very tangible that they can really wrap their their head around, right? So, um, moving forward here a little bit, and we've seen a lot of. Um, um, companies and, and, uh, and organizations try to build their own platform. Some of them actually, some of, the, some of the OEMs out there, the large OEMs have actually provided platforms, but we really see them in two different uh, uh, models. First off, uh, a lot of these platforms that, that we're talking about, the, the, the automation orchestration platforms, they either start at like an infrastructure operations perspective and are kind of trying to move into kind of delivering application services on top of that, or they started at the application services and they're moving down into some of the infrastructure layers uh, to automate and orchestrate some of the infrastructure layers. What we found though is that in order to drive better efficiency and, and affect the revenue stream of, uh, or the mission of these specific companies, um, the applications are really where the, the company's end users are actually getting service from. So we see a lot of uh, a quicker time to value when you look at that uh, helping the automating application deployments and applications, uh, and, and of course in some sort of a DevOps model versus just task by task or infrastructure based automation and orchestration. It's less, less uh, visible to the company uh, and less visible to the uh, application owners that are servicing the end customers. So if we, if we take a look at these decisions, I'll build this slide out real quick. There's, we've kind of put together these slides and, and the analogy is kind of, you know, forced to a fully built house. And, and the idea behind this is, is when you make a decision for your organization, you need to kind of look at the spectrum of what, what the possibilities are. So all the way over to the left, you could start at square one. You could start at, you know, a, a Python, you know, a command prompt, and I'm going to build my own platform that services my needs. Some of the issues with that are is the time to value. You're starting at square one. You're starting to build your entire platform from the ground up. Um, your program experience better be very high, and also you better have an army of, of developers or uh, or, or a significant amount of man hours to, to, to put towards this. The flip side of that is that you also can customize it to your exact uh, use case that you need. All the way over to the right, the fully built house is usually up front. It's usually the highest cost. You're paying for what another company, organization, OEM have already built for you. Um, usually out of the box though, you're getting canned workflows and automations. The time to value is usually pretty short because you can install it. It does do a lot of stuff right out of the box for you. Um, but you're, in your program experience, you may not need any at all. You may just need to learn how to operate it, or you need a very low uh, expectation on program expertise. Man hours can also be low to get it up and running to provide an initial uh, time to value. But on the flip side of that as well, it's usually the least customizable. And in order to customize a lot of things, you have to kind of wait on the, the manufacturer or the OEM to, to build some of your use cases in there. So what we see on either side of those spectrums, a lot of, a lot of customers have started on the left-hand side and have been unsuccessful. Uh, a lot of customers have bought on the right-hand side and found out that they bought something that wasn't really going to do you know, uh, their specific use case or their use cases that they need to build. So what we see, though, is in the middle where the Lincoln logs are, is that this is where people are actually looking at today. I need something that I can, a platform that gives me enough extensibility so I can build my use case into it. I need the ability to, to develop, so I do need a little bit of programming experience. Um, I do need to understand what APIs are to be able to integrate systems together. 
Um, my cost in man hours is a little bit higher uh, than buying the platform, and it could be a lot higher as well, depending on on what you might pick uh, from that from that bucket. Um, it's customizable, but there usually are some limitations associated with it. And a lot of times, non-programmers can learn uh, these types of orchestration tools uh, with 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 a little bit of uh, uh, training um, in, in in somewhat of a short period of time. I'm glad you. I'm glad. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You go, Mark. Sorry, you go, Mark. Oh, no, that might. Oh, no, that wasn't. I, I was just going to say, Joe, that I'm, I'm glad you broke out those three there because I think, I mean, maybe a year ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you, you guys speak to a lot of people, but I think probably a year ago, a lot of people believed that automation was only for the ones in the left category that had the army of developers that could throw all that resource at it. You know, it was only there for, for Twitter, for Facebook, for Google, and unless you had those resources, it just wasn't worth trying. And I, and I think. I'm hoping, but I think a lot of people have evolved on from that over the last 12 months and have, have moved forward a little bit from that, that thinking. Would, would that be fair to say? Yeah, I would say that the most customers are looking at just automation orchestration as a mountain, and some of them don't even want to take the first step. And I think that's a lot of the challenges because they look at it as you know the forest on the left-hand side when they need, really need to look at it as what tools and tool chains can we use in order to get to the use case that we need to make our operations and our um, overall architecture more efficient so that we can save time, money, and provide a better service to our end customer. So it's, it's very interesting as, as they start to, at first, push away the, the nose of the world. No, 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 we don't have time, we don't have money. And they really start to dig into it. They start to realize that they do have a lot of times some of the expertise on staff they didn't know about, but on top of that, there are some some tooling out there, some platforms out there that 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 help them out in that journey. Yeah, and and I think an important thing to to think about too is, and Joe, maybe you can help answer this, is you know, some organizations have um, folks on there that maybe have developed scripts or techniques to automate and, and orchestrate certain things. And I noticed that um, that some of these tools coming out there have ways to sort of integrate and leverage your, you know, what you've already sort of built um, is even a stepping stone or or sort of, you know, maintain that intellectual property, if you will, that you've done. So is that something you're starting to see with a lot of these tools and a lot of this journey is how do we maximize the investment we've already made because we have accomplished something, but also be able to integrate that sort of moving forward with, a, with an overall vision? Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with you uh, from a standpoint is that you need a platform that allows you to take any kind of IP that you've created with little to no effort and integrated that into that workflow or that platform. And I think uh, I, I think that's an important piece. Another piece as well that we see that that customers are are successful with if their platform supports the open programming languages. And the reason that we say that is that the expertise for customized programming languages out there in the marketplace is very very hard to find those folks um, on a specific platform. Uh, if it has a you know one off of a, a you know Java or, or or something along those lines, so if it, it can accept common programming languages that can be injected into the workflow, we see the most success those, with those types of tools. Um, and and moving forward, I think that the other ones that have the one off programming languages, maybe some of the the older stuff that was that's built you know a couple years back, is probably going to go by the wayside in lieu of the ability to hire folks that understand how to use common programming languages to be able to develop inside of the platform with, with little with little effort and little training comparatively to learning a brand new programming language from scratch. Cool, and uh, if I was to kind of put a high level uh, slide, let me build this out. This is how we kind of see all of these things fitting together um, mode one, mode two, kind of where they sit um, and where where things actually reside. What we're going to talk about today is is more so right at the service delivery orchestration and configuration management layers uh, of this specific, uh, I would say, eye chart that we have. So let's jump in. For, for those that don't understand, uh, or don't understand Cloud Center, don't know where it came from. So Cisco recently bought, as of la mid last year, 2016, they bought a company called Clicker, 
they changed the name to Cisco Cloud Center. But the, the idea behind it is, is they bought a, a orchestration platform that was focused solely on the, on the application. And you can probably, the folks out there that understand you know, Cisco's portfolio out there inside the data center, they're really looking to focus on the application uh, um, more so now than they ever have before. So this fit, fits right in with a lot of the, uh, the, the, the innovation Cisco has been putting out there around uh, application-centric infrastructure. Um, so the idea behind it is that I have a single platform to develop, develop my application modeling inside of in my deployment and managing from. And I, and I want to make a, a really, really uh, point, really, really good point here is that this is focused on the application lifecycle, not necessarily the OS, but the application lifecycle. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. But the idea is, is I have a single platform to be able to deploy to my local data center, my private cloud, or my public cloud. And I model my application one time, and I can deploy to any one of those clouds. So the idea behind this is really, let's make our applications cloud agnostic. Let's make our automations for the applications cloud agnostic. And, and the idea about what Cisco Cloud Center does is it builds in those specific infrastructure automations for the different clouds that you connect to. So what they built for you is a kind of a jump start um, to, to getting to a DevOps model or CI CD uh, pipeline. So the reason I say that is that a lot of uh, a lot of our customers seem to want to try to build their own. What they have to do for the specific, let's say the data base, say OpenStack versus Amazon, each one of the infrastructure uh, uh, artifacts that need to be created in the automations are different between those two uh, those two clouds. So they have to know those nuances, keep up with those nuances as well as they as they progress those uh, those stacks, private and public cloud offerings. It also offers the uh, a very sim simplistic approach. If you just have a single cloud, maybe it's VMware vSphere, and I just want to deploy, let's say, uh, infrastructure as a service. And when we talk about infrastructure as a service, we're really just talking about what kind of what AWS uh, initially first offered, which was we can we can deploy a VM for you, get all the storage, the networking, and uh, CPUs, everything set up for you, and then you can go load your application on it. You can do something as easy as that, or you can do something very uh, a lot more complicated, where I have multiple clouds underneath uh, Cloud Center, and I'm deploying uh, applications on top of that infrastructure as a service. So the kind of the, the secret sauce behind this is, is that there's a manager and a monitor. Uh, if I if I want to get into some of the, the the technical pieces, a manager function and a monitor function. Um, within Cisco Cloud Center, those actually are the are kind of the the web interface. We'll get into it here in a little bit. I have a, I have a short little demo of the show, and and uh, the monitor will actually monitor that each cloud is is ready to accept uh, uh, orchestration as well. Each cloud has its own individual orchestrator. So when you load the orchestrator, you load it for that specific cloud because each orchestrator has the knows the API calls to make for that specific cloud. So the orchestrator for OpenStack will be different from the orchestrator for, let's say, Microsoft Azure. And then kind of if you look at an overall picture from an end-to-end -end, uh, automation orchestration perspective, over on the top left, typically what we see is ServiceNow. That's more of our kind of our service catalog, our ITSM, our uh, uh, where we store our configuration uh, artifacts and uh, of our applications, um, and also our self-service portal. Uh, a lot of times, we see a lot of uh, traction around ServiceNow. In the middle is where really we're talking about how do we how do we have the application lifecycle management. And on the top right is how do we integrate some of the uh, some of the DevOps tools like Jenkins into our CI/CD pipeline, and how do those integrate in as well? That's really what it is. And if you look at the bottom left. Um, it, it's kind of funny, but we we kind of put vending machines there because from an application owner's perspective, um, the data center is a vending machine. They really want to put in a you know put in a dollar and out comes a bag of chips is what they want. Uh, they want to they want to order up a, a virtual machine and out, out pops a you know sent CentOS seven. That's what they really want from their data center. 
So even though there, there's probably plenty of uh, different types of OEMs that, that reside within the data center, what they really want is almost the, uh, the push button, get banana approach. They don't care as long as they're getting the performance, uh, the reliability, and the availability. They necessarily don't care what OEM's hardware that it's on. It's kind of an interesting paradigm. If you look at what a data center, private, or public cloud is to a uh, application owner, it's a set of resources, compute, storage, and networking, and also security. I, I really like the way you position that there, Joey. That, that no developer wants to be dragged into that that infrastructure's domain knowledge requirement to get it running. They just don't need to know. Their job is revenue generating apps and services or productivity improving apps and services. Not what, what does the like API look like or the nuances of that piece of hardware that, that it's just stopping them getting their job done, getting the app deployed. Like You're right, that's exactly how it would be. And I, I, I've come across this more and more, especially the second half of last year, I, I started to hear a lot of pushback from, from customers saying that they wanted us to respond to a programmability capability study, which before a year ago, I'd never even heard of. And they're measuring vendors against API lifecycle management. How do you deliver your API, support it? How do you handle deprecation in your API? And I mean, it's great. Like it came out of nowhere. The second half of the last year of 2016, just it got more and more common. But it's great because it's showing us what people are thinking and and how they're starting to look for those vending machines now. They want to know that vendors are doing the right API because they've been very open in stating that look, we don't care if you're the number one at what your individual devices can do, but if you're not programmable you break our entire operating model, we would rather have the number 10 technology that's programmable with good API lifecycle than the number one that's a pain to manage and totally kills our continuous deployment pipeline. Like, are you guys hearing that same thing? Yeah, I mean, for, from my standpoint, definitely. And, and I steal a term that I think Joe, at least at Worldwide, used a lot was silos of excellence. So if you dumb it down even further and we have all these independent teams that are you know, um, have their own priorities, their own sort of way of doing things. You're looking at this, you know, continuous model, this kind of higher vision. You have to somehow bring these together. Um, and if everybody's responsible for their own piece of infrastructure within those, they have to be programmable and they have to be able to, to you know, interoperate together to provide a lot of this. So, you know, sometimes people don't like to hear it, especially in IT, but, you know, you're not the center of the universe, right? So there's definitely a business, you know, uh, reason you're doing something and, and for you to, to, to embrace that and say, you know what, um, I have a service that I'm going to offer and I want to make sure that that service is, is easily accessible. I can, I can, you know, here's a way that I can provide that service up to this sort of higher level kind of workflow. And I think, you know, part of Joe's demo he's going to show here in a little bit really kind of tells that tale of how we take all these independent, you know, silos or groups and teams with politics and kind of bring those together. I'm just going to quickly delete that off my LinkedIn profile center of the universe. I didn't realize I couldn't. Uh, real quick, one, one, thing to, one thing to add to, to Mark's point there. In the future, and I'm going to put this very simplistically, there's going to be two types of people inside of IT. Um, there's going to be button creators and button pushers. I didn't make that up. I think it came from uh, uh, one, of the, one of your colleagues over there at, at F5. But okay. I, what I want to add to that comment is that this is a significant difference in pay scale between a button pusher and a button creator. So if you're looking at where you want to be in the next five to 10 years, hopefully hopefully uh, we're looking at becoming button creators because you provide more value and most likely you're going to be, you're also going to be paid more. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so real quick before we jump into the demo, maybe I can uh, walk through the workflow because it happens really fast. I kind of want to walk through what, what happens here. Um, so uh, through the Cloud Center UI we're going to use today, we're, this could easily have come originally from ServiceNow, making an API call to Cloud Center. One thing that you said is around the API. Uh, Cloud Center does have a full and open REST API fully documented. And I think one of the pieces here, and I'll take a little tangent, is one of the pieces here around the, the whole concept of APIs and, 
and understanding the API lifecycle is not only that, an API is only as good as it is documented. So it, it, we really need a lot of these OEMs to fully document their API so that customers can take advantage of it in a quick manner instead of having to run through all the, the testing and, and experimentation to see how it operates. So we're gonna we're gonna make a uh, we're gonna call an application deployment uh, through Cisco Cloud Center. The first thing it's gonna do, and obviously this is running on top of an application-centric infrastructure, Cisco uh, Next Generation Data Center Fabric. It's gonna create the the necessary JSON or XML, the markup language that it, that that uh, ACI will will accept, and it's going to communicate to the to the APIC. Um, on top of that, it's going to create the application network profiles, the filters, contracts, connect the, the endpoint groups or EPGs together, and also attach the VMM domain. Yeah, and, and, and Joe, you know, and I think in this example, um, the way that you mentioned earlier with Cloud Center, no matter the underlying infrastructure, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, the Cisco version or the VMware version or even a public cloud, essentially it, it abstracts that and does all those advanced configurations which may take a long time for you, right? So so as, a, as an application um, owner developer, if I want to deploy this, I don't necessarily need to know those nuances underneath. Is that right? Yeah, what, what, what the application owner needs to care about is how much, what does my instance type look like or what is my, what is my uh, hardware requirement for my specific tier of the application? And then also, what, how, do, how, do those, how do those tiers of applications communicate together? And how are those tiers dependent on each other? For instance, is my, da my database needs to be up and operational before my, let's say, my, my mid or my web tier comes online. With you, and also, it, it, it also lends itself uh, to, to not having to use like something like ACI and using something like NSX. NSX is also another supported uh, uh, SDN fabric that, that is out of the box with Cisco Cloud Center. The, uh, the extensibility of NSX within the Cloud Center platform isn't, isn't, as, uh, isn't as full and mature though as the, the ACI as to be expected, of course. Um, one thing that happens next, um, ACI itself makes its own API call over to, to vCenter using the, the virtual machine manager domain construct where it creates all of the, uh, the networking constructs on the virtual hypervisor inside of VMware vCenter to allow, uh, to have a landing spot for the virtual machines to take advantage of from a networking point of view. So, so ACI does that uh, programmatically for you between the APIC controller and uh, VMware's vCenter. After that has been created, Cloud Center makes an API call over to, to vCenter. And what it's doing is it's cloning a virtual machine from a specific template. Um, it's not like cloning like the entire, let's say, like a WordPress app, which we'll be deploying here in a second. But, but what it's doing is cloning the base OS. It's uh, checking to see if uh, uh, Cloud Center's um, uh, agent is loaded. And if not, it'll load the agent. Um, after the OS comes fully online and, and ready to receive commands, the, the uh, VM and Cloud Center communicate uh, using uh, the, the clicker tools or, or Cloud Center tools, uh, and Cloud Center tells the VM what to do next. So what it would do next was it would start loading the application per the application blueprint um, or application uh, profile, I should say. And, and what happens next is in our workflows, after that full-blown application is built, we we built some some Python scripting to to integrate with InfoBlocks. InfoBlocks is an IP address management system that allows for uh, we're using it in this case from DNS and also IP address management. So what our Python script does is it runs out, grabs the next available IP address inside the subnet that we specified, and then also assigns a fully qualified domain name associated with it. Those pieces of information. We make another uh, REST API call out to uh, an F5 LTM. From there, we create the uh, the nodes, which are basically the the backend servers for uh, uh, within F5's constructs. The pools, which is a grouping of of nodes uh, within F5, and then of course the virtual servers and the IP address we just gathered from InfoBlocks. Also to note, the nodes. 
um, IP address are gathered dynamically throughout the deployment, meaning that at the beginning of the deployment, I have no idea what the identity of my nodes will be or the IP address. So what happens is Cloud Center actually orchestrates and injects those pieces of information into the, uh, into the F5 based off of what it gathered during the deployment process. So, so Joe, real quick on this, you mentioned the, the, the DNS management and the IPAM management from, or from an info blocks, right, and the F5 piece. And you mentioned Python code for that. Was that something that you had to sit down and, and open up Notepad and write, or, or was there a plugin for, for Cloud Center? Just kind of curious on the, uh, the, the actual integration there and how Cloud Center can integrate with plugins or things that don't exist. So, so we wrote those. Those are two pieces. We uh, we went out. We obviously, uh, as a good developer or a good DevOps person would do, um, th what what we really did was go out and, and grab different pieces. So uh, there was a gentleman that already wrote an Infobox Python module that we ended up using a couple functions out of um, within our within our uh, environment. And there's also uh, some some. Different functions created around F5. We liked them, but we actually changed them quite a bit to fit our use case. But a lot of those things we didn't create necessarily from scratch, but we did create the overall scripts scripts from, I would say, Notepad. But we pulled in a lot of uh, already uh, very publicly accessible uh, functions and stuff like that to create the overall script. Now, those scripts are actually deployed at certain times within the workflow as well. So that's that's kind of where, where Clicker comes into play to be able to, or Cloud Center comes into play to be able to, to run those scripts at specific times during the uh, orchestration. So it would be fair to say that folks that maybe aren't, um, you know, super up to speed on things like Python or, or, or doing things sort of from scratch can leverage already available libraries and things on like GitHub and other areas where I can reuse those and sort of easily plug those into Cloud Center to solve a, a certain use case that may not be out of the box available. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it does. In fact, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you guys this as well, uh, where the scripts are located are actually in GitHub. Our own, we have our own internal instance of GitHub here at WBT, and, and that's where all the scripts are located. So if I wanted to change a script, those scripts aren't loaded on like the templates of the VMs or anything like that. My script is loaded in a centralized repository and downloaded at time of deployment so that if I need to change my script, that next run of the, of the orchestration will have the latest changes to that script. Nice. So you've got a continuous integration pipeline as part of your continuous deployment pipeline. Yeah. Some that's point. So as far as uh, the, the slides go, that's all I have. Let me, uh, let me pull up. There's Mark's face. Let me uh, first, uh, I'll jump into um, kind of give you the underlying environment, what we have set up. This is Cloud Center. First, I want to jump into our, uh, our ACI fabric and kind of kind of show you how that's set up. If we, uh, if we jump into our, our tenants, I want to kind of show, uh, show some of the constructs that we were talking about, talking about the EPGs, filters, contracts, application network profiles. Um, I'm going to open up some of these just so we can see it, see it get built. So I'll open up my uh, application network profile or application profiles. Um, and we'll also see uh, our, our filters and contracts as well. Also, let's go ahead and log into our F5 uh, and, and show you what's uh, currently out there as far as uh, the LTM is. So we'll take a look at our nodes. And, and we'll notice there are no nodes, there are no pools yet, and there are also virtual servers. Also, we'll jump into InfoBlox and uh, take a quick look at the, uh, the current subnet that's out there. We're actually going to be using this 242.0/25 subnet. And if I take a look here, it looks like the next available IP is 242.2. .2, so we should see that actually being used throughout the automation. If I jump back over to Cloud Center, um, I want to I want to go in and kind of show you the application, and then I'm going to kick it off, and we're going to watch some things actually build. Um, here's our application. We're actually going to deploy F, uh, WordPress with F5. Come on and take a look at this specific modeled application. Um, this the, the interface on Cloud Center is very very easy to use. It, it's a uh, it's almost like building a, a Visio diagram. Drag and drop uh, the application uh, where you or the the tier how you need it. You can easily remove them. These little lines between the tiers are application dependency mapping and also 
how the how the uh, uh, tiers communicate to each other. What I mean by that, when you have something like application-centric infrastructure uh, or ACI by Cisco, those it, it is a whitelist model, so it's uh, um, uh, denied by default or allowed by exception. So when I have uh, my SQL being offered up here. I can actually model the ports and protocols that that are that actually are allowed between the two different tiers. So that is so basically from an application owner's perspective, my service I, I call it my service that I'm offering up are these ports. Who can utilize these services? Well, in this specific setup, my my web tier or my web EPG can communicate to my uh, MySQL or database tier. And my database tier is actually offering up those ports and protocols. That's cool. If I run through this, nice. That's that's cool. That's very cool. Through uh, uh, this little setup, each one of these tiers, these are actually what we call services. These are located. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to services after we've kicked the deployment off. These services can be configured. They're very extensive, and you can you can create your own services, and you can uh, associate different base images with them. In this case, I can I could I could use Ubuntu, CentOS 7, 6, Ubuntu uh, 12.04 if I wanted to, um, with with web services already built. I can allow it to have a, a minimum node. This is how many nodes are going to be uh, deployment. If I wanted one and then scale up, I could as well. Um, I'm going to start with two so we can actually show that it actually has multiple nodes into the pool. You can also have a max scaling size as well. This all has to do with what the application owners and how they built their application and what it's capable of. Um, there's some other things inside of here around uh, some pre-start scripts, um, also some external scripts. These external scripts are actually run from a Docker container um, on the orchestrator for the cloud that we're deploying to. We talked about the firewall rules. One other thing that this allows you to do uh, as well is, is not necessarily have to deploy a VM with a service. There's something called an external service. And all that external service is is running some sort of script or, or process that isn't necessarily deploying a virtual machine uh, or deploying infrastructure as a service for that specific tier. This, this little arrow, since there isn't going to be anything deployed, that little arrow says, don't run whatever this is until this is fully built okay. from a dependency mapping deployment perspective. On top of that, Cisco Cloud Center also allows you to, to, to specify your own uh, parameters that are used within the scripts to go in and, and do things. And these, these, can be, uh, these can be different parameters that you want to suck into your environment. For instance, we're, we'll have the what's the external URL of this application. This will actually be the the URL associated with the virtual IP address on the F5. Also, what's my uh, URL domain? Because when I go and I communicate with InfoBlocks, I have to tell it what the domain is as well. Then, of course, I, I've, I've put together a, a little parameter that emails the, the end user as well, letting them know that their, uh, their, their, their uh, um, application is done deploying. Um, this does have a level of version control as well inside of this environment. I obviously it's version one, revision two. Um, I can go and I can change this to uh, version two and save it really quick. And what you're going to notice uh, once it's saved, well, here let's just leave it as version one real quick, so it doesn't bark at me. And what you can do is you can go back and deploy. I'll show you one that we actually have a bunch of different versions on. Yeah, you can go back you're and messing with a live demo here. That's pretty brave changing versions. <laughs> But there's, there's different ways. If you take a look, I can go and deploy any of these versions and go back and take a look at what those versions were at the, any given time um, so that I can kind of say, okay, so I just deployed this application. It didn't, you know, 4.4 didn't actually deploy the same way or it failed, but 4.3 never failed. Let's go and take a look at the differences between the two as well inside of this system. So just that's, that's actually really important. I talk a lot to people about infrastructure as code. And treating configurations, you know, there's a lot of organizations are saving their configs now in like Git repositories or, or even uh, in, in wikis, but using the revision control and being able to do a diff between them to see, you know, I know that build was good. This is a new one we're testing. We can roll back if needed just by literally pulling the previous one out. But this is a step further again. This is a workflow, like treating a workflow as code with revisioning around it. 
And, and don't forget the, the level of uh, uh, security and application dependency mapping on top of that. And there's a many, many things that are out of the box. A lot of the things that, that I'm scrolling through here are out of the box. Docker's out of the box. A whole bunch of uh, stuff out of the box. UCS Director, if you have it. Uh, they have their own Puppet and Chef. We decided to make our own Puppet service because uh, we wanted to change ours or customize ours just a little bit more. So we created our own uh, Puppet service. Uh, of course, front end load, load balancers, we created our F5 LTM. Uh, HA proxy and GenX, those types of uh, things are out there as well. And of course, all the common, uh, uh, I say, web servers, uh, web server um, uh, applications that are out there. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and deploy. So, I can just drop down and hit click deploy. What comes up next is the, the application deployment window. So, let's go ahead and, and create this. We'll make this uh, uh, Red Talks. That's the name of our uh, server here. So we'll call this Red Talks. This is our application. Uh, down through here, if you remember those global parameters, these are a lot of the global parameters. We've already defaulted some. One of them we didn't default. We, we required it for the application to deploy because we actually specified that, um, is we need an external URL. We've hard set what our domain name is going to be, but we want them to be able to see what that is as well. So we kind of threw that in there, but I can't change any of this. Um, I can also go and I can change my uh, who I, where I wanted to send it to. Um, obviously, I'll send it to my address as well. And then we can go down and look at the tier. So I've got my web tier here. And if there's any security profiles or, or tags, there is a, a level of governance. And let me take a step here and talk about governance, which is if I have an application that can only be deployed on a specific uh, environment, let's say HIPAA, I can tag the application with HIPAA. And then I can also tag the deployment environment with HIPAA. So therefore, my application will never be able to be deployed to anything else but HIPAA. Compliant environment. That's handy. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, very, very important. Um, one of the things we did with services, though, is we actually put in some custom parameters within the service around um, the, the monitor and the external uh, service port as well uh, for that F5 LTM instance. Here on the next screen, this is what we actually see here, which is many of the different environments that we can deploy to. Um, for instance, we're going to deploy to a vCenter environment that has an AC on top, right on top of ACI. Um, and I want to kind of scroll down just a little bit. If you take a look here, here's all the different parameters for specifically vCenter, the data center, the ANO cluster, and whatnot. So here's our actual vCenter. If you take a look, uh, this actually marries up to a lot of the things that you see here. Um, if I go over and look at my hosts and clusters, you're going to notice that the ANO-cluster1, that's, that's actually there as well. Uh, and allows you to go through and say, do I want a full clone? This is this is different than a linked clone. So if I have a full clone, I, I'm cloning from scratch. A linked clone is I'm immediately establishing another instance of it residing on the same host. So I can do that as well. I can uh, turn on an ACI extension. And this extension is something new within Cloud Center as of uh, uh, their 4.6 uh, release, where I can turn on an ACI extension and allow it to go out and provision ACI in a more uh, clean manner than their previous versions. Um, inside of here, I can choose also the instance type. And one other big thing around any orchestration platform or even cloud management platform is really what this is, is I need to know cost. How much do these instances cost me to run it on top of? Now, this is a private uh, cloud. This is a VMware cloud. This is in my, in my data center. But if I go and I switch this, this is live. If I switch this to something like AWS, you're going to notice something different down here. That's actually making an API call at the time that I switch it out to AWS and grabbing all the information of the current uh, uh, available uh, instance types for me. On top of that, you're going to see that these specific parameters have changed because now we're dealing with the, the way that <clears throat> AWS actually instantiates those artifacts to storage. If I was to switch it over to... Uh, uh, Azure, scroll down here, same same thing, different instance types that they provide. And here I've actually locked down what's allowed. That's cool. Uh, so, I like that there's so, like so, governance step in there as well. You've decided what's editable. Um, that, that's going to make people a little happier about yeah. handing over automation to third-party departments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's yeah. – so let's, uh, one other big thing that we've heard from customers is – I've got this converged infrastructure stack. I've got this a hyper converged stack, and um, I want to make it more easy to use for my application owners. You can literally take Cloud Center in about 
two hours, two and a half hours with a basic install, turn that grouping of resources into a cloud-like environment that you see here and deploy, uh, I would say, your templates or infrastructure as a service, just, you know, CentOS, Ubuntu, Windows, whatever, in a pretty, pretty short order. So let's get back to the demo. We kind of took a tangent there. Let's go ahead and make our web servers uh, two virtual CPUs by four gigs uh, of RAM and, and 10 gigs of storage. Um, down here, you're going to notice some ACI constructs. Um, I can pick what tenant. We're going to use the C3 demo tenant. I can pick whether or not that this uh, this tier, which is a web tier, has access outside of the uh, outside of the ACI fabric. In this case, I'm going to leave that it is. Um, from an endpoint group or EPG perspective, I can create new, or I can use an existing one, uh, or I can also do a bridge domain template. We're, we won't go into that today, but uh, it does give you a lot of options as well. You also pick your bridge domain when you're using the when you or deploying a new EPG. Down in my database here, we'll make it the same. We'll leave all everything the same, except for maybe I don't want my database to have access outside of the ACI fabric. So I'm going to remove the layer three out. That's probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that's wise. So, uh, and then down here, we're going to leave those the same, the F5 LTM. One very important piece here, I just clicked on something. This is new in the latest version, is that everything you see there now can be, you can actually go and take a look at the the body of a REST call that you can make to deploy this application. So you could take those values, the key value pairs, and take the values and use parameters and run this through some other orchestration engine for deployment. Now that's cool. So I could be on the end of my continuous deployment tool chain when I finish that last bit of code. It's been approved to go live. I can then make the call to Cloud Center and say, look, here's the data you need. Go. You know, developers don't like GUIs as much as, as some of us uh, people who start out in infrastructure. So a lot of times they'd rather see a command line and hit a button to, to run a command and have it go deploy itself. So uh, it, they, they found that out there. It's always been documented, but they made it really, really easy to just copy, paste, and replace some parameters. We're going to hit deploy. And when we hit deploy, I'm going to pull up a couple of things. Um, I'm going to, this is actually the deployment window. Yellow means it's starting up. Um, I'm going to pull up my the ACI fabric. As you can see really quickly, the, it made the API calls to, to create those objects within ACI. And if I go and I take a look inside of uh, VMware vCenter, ACI made a call over to VMware vCenter and created some new port groups. From there, uh, Cloud Center is going, going to go through after those port groups are created. Cloud Center is going to go go through and actually clone from a uh, from, um, some of our templates, and if you take a look down here, we actually have some, some templates here. It's going to clone those specific uh, uh, workloads. In this case, it should be, uh, uh, I think, Ubuntu 1204, I think, were the ones that were created. And as you can see right there, I'm cloning those, those workloads. You can see it actually, that's one of them. We're going to have a total of three VMs here, so it's going to create uh, uh, two web front ends, because that's what was the original uh, blueprint, and then uh, uh, a MySQL uh, back end. So that's the point right now. The last thing that's actually going to occur uh, is is the um, back end uh, uh, F5 implementation, if you remember the workflow, the info blocks, and then, of course, uh, instantiating the F5. So with that being said, this does take a little while for the OS to come fully online, the application to load, and then F5 uh, is, is the F5 and info blocks integration takes, uh, takes a little, little over uh, 13, 14 seconds. But with that, as this is deploying, because you can kind of see the life cycle of the deployment as it's going, uh, green means that it's actually going. There's a refresh rate by default of 30 seconds. But you can go in here and take a look. Um, once these, once this gets populated, we're going to actually see the, the actual public IP, private IP, if that's your cloud. Um, and then, of course, any of the uh, after the OS comes fully online, you're going to see any of the operations that happened underneath of it. So we're going to let this run. And um, any questions, uh, Nathan or, or, or Mark? Any comments? So, so Joe, you know, you, you're touching many different um, products or infrastructure, right, with, within this environment. Um, is there kind of a ballpark? And I know it's hard to quantify, but I mean, it just seems like the amount of time saved from um, I got my my VMware guy. I got my database guy. I got my you know Apache guy. I got my F5 guy. I got a guy for everything, right? 
So now all of a sudden, these guys can build these sort of templates, if you will, that Cloud Center can call and deploy. I mean, it, it just seems like just, just the amount of time saved right here um, is tremendous from deploying, you know, all of these, you know, I don't have a ticket, pass it to the next team, ticket, pass it to the next team. This seems to just do it all, all together. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's really where the efficiencies gain were is a, is, is a lot that has to do with the process and automating those processes so that I don't have to, you know, there's a ticket sent over to our, our, our virtual infrastructure folks. You have to wait for them to get back from lunch to go clone their clone a machine for you and then apply specific uh, scripts or whatever they whatever they do and however those processes work. And then, you know, two or three days later, I have a I have a virtual machine. Um, this is a lot of the reasons why some of our developers uh, are choosing AWS, Azure, and some of the public cloud offerings because all that backend stuff is actually automated. What Cloud Center uh, or Clicker, whatever you want to call it these days, is what it's doing for you is giving you that uh, that public cloud um, or private cloud type uh, environment um, on your on your private or your public cloud type uh, setup on your private cloud environment. So that that look and feel of the uh, of the of the public cloud, the click, you know, push button, get banana. That is, that can be achieved inside of your own private data center. Now. Yeah, and I and I. So then it really. I was going to Go say that that what you said right there, I think, is important because you know a, a lot of customers that maybe aren't on bleeding edge are are probably running VMware for virtualization and maybe already have F5 and run these applications. So it's not like they have to invest and go off the deep end and all this you know, private cloud, you know, containers and everything, they can actually leverage a lot of this with just their existing environments without really um, completely changing out their infrastructure. Yeah, on top of that, think about, so, and, and I'll talk about benchmarkings here at the end, but think about um, if I had a, if I'm a developer within a within an organization, within a company, and I had a choice, if I got the same experience, whether I deployed to the public environment or my private environment, um, and cost was the same, and performance was the same, I think I know where I would deploy. Any good corporate citizen would deploy to probably their private environment for their own security and the, the company's intellectual property. The, the problem is, is that those are not equal. Um, the, the, the user experience is not equal, both the same, you know, in a time to, time to, to get their, their, their requests or the time to get their, their server to even do anything isn't equal either. So I think this is where this is really starting to level the playing field between public and private when you have the ability to do things like what we're showing here. The, the thing, uh, real quick, he's jumped out at me um, just watching you go ahead. through this now, Joe. So, I mean, the first one was that that's clearly not just saving hours of work per deployment. We're talking days, even weeks of time because there's that lag between each division or team or person doing their job. It doesn't happen in sequence one after the other. Like we're talking weeks of work just got replaced. But the other thing, I remember when a lot of automation and people started talking about DevOps and those things, and there was a lot of people thinking, well, am I going to be just put out of a job? And well, no, actually, you end up with a better job because instead of being reactive to a queue, you become the supporting manager of the architecture and the delivery mechanism. And it's not a reactive job. It's a proactive job you get to have with this automation. It's, it's your job to present these services in an automated fashion and support the presentation of these services versus just literally every day coming in and looking at the queue that just gets longer and longer and having to type the same commands on the CLI. I mean, funny that you use monkey as the, the, the banana as the, the metaphor. Yeah. yeah, it literally does feel like that when that's, that's all you're doing. Remember, you're a button pusher, a button creator. Be the creator. Be the proactive. Yes. yes. So to kind of finish this out, I do want to I do want to throw some things over here. You're going to notice some IP addresses that were gathered dynamically, actually through DHCP. Cloud Center does integrate with InfoBlox directly during the deployment process, uh, outside of what we already what we built. Or uh, I think there's a, there's also another IPM solution they integrate with. But uh, we're using DHCP in this environment, so we got a couple addresses, uh, 242.35, and also 242.27. So there was a, when this thing started up, it, it went through its uh, life cycle of deploying this application. All that being said, also F5 ran and went and deployed its, uh, its script that we actually executed on the external service. So we saw um, the, 
we saw the application network profile actually deploy. You're going to notice in the EPGs, I don't have an F5 one. Uh, that's because Cloud Center is intelligent enough to know that that tier of the application was an external service, and it's not actually deploying a virtual machine. So if I jump over to Infoblox, and let me refresh Infoblox real quick, what we're going to see is that it grabbed the, that very first IP address within uh, Infoblox. So um, once this gets done refreshing here, hopefully I didn't lose my connection to Infoblox and makes me log back in. Uh, we, we're going to see that that URL that we that we input. I think it was redtalks.sandbox.wtatc.local actually be inserted into Infoblox. So you can see right there, redtalks.sandbox.wt.local. Uh, if I jump over to F5, of course it wants me to log back in. So I'll log back into F5 and I'll go ahead and take a look at my LTM again. Let's t first take a look at our nodes. Uh, two things to, to point out here: the address is 242.35 and 242.27 were actually uh, a use. So that was gathered during the time of the deployment and inserted as node. From a pool's perspective, we also see the uh, the the actual uh, uh, pool that we created. We also called it the same thing as the application. And of course, the members of those pools and their associated IP addresses, services, service port. Then if we take a look at the virtual server as well, it also created the virtual server utilizing the IP address gathered during the time of deployment from InfoBlocks. So well, if I, just, I go I noticed up everything and, uh, was green there as well, which means you added the monitor on that you mentioned, and it checked that it's all there. Yep, and it's working. Make sure I can type today. Sandbox. So this is actually giving me my uh, my actual WordPress application that I deployed. Nice. Configuring it. I'll put my uh, my email in there. Go ahead and install WordPress. Just to show you, this is a fully functioning app uh, right here. Uh, if I jump in, demo, demo, and then log in, you're going to notice that I am a fully functional WordPress application running through my F5. This is awesome. And coincidentally, Red Talks is hosted on WordPress, but it took me <laughs> a lot longer to set it up than what you just did. And you did a highly resilient multi tiered <laughs> solution and all I had to do was get my credit card out. So it still <laughs> took you less time to build all of that infrastructure. Yeah, so one, one thing to, that's very important as well, it's one thing to also build it out and all those configuration artifacts. It's another thing to tear it back down. So let me give you an example of this. So if I wanted to terminate this application, I could simply click terminate and go ahead, go ahead and hit yes. And it actually starts the termination process. And I'm going to pull up a couple of the, uh, the, the, the different element managers in here. You're going to notice that it's powering off those virtual machines. It's going to delete those virtual machines. And I want you guys to look quickly over here to the left. You're going to see those artifacts with an ACI disappear. So those are gone. And if I go look at my uh, F5, I go look at my nodes. Pools are all gone, and my virtual servers are all gone as well. I can so it's completely that's really cool, but I don't like that you just terminated Red Talks. That 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 <laughs> kind of stung a little bit. So so that's that's kind of the the extent of the demo um, that 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 I have today for this. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and and maybe some some comments, some anything from you guys. I mean, uh, you know, one thing that that you know, I try to say, and we, you know, dealing with different teams, right? Um, and especially on Joe's team is just interoperability and understanding how to leverage ways to interoperate. I, I have Infoblox, I have F5, I have Cisco ACI. How do I make all them work together, right? So I think it's so important to really, you know, maybe you don't have to be a full-fledged Python programmer as a network engineer, but it's probably a good idea to start, you know, taking step one, step two, step three, looking at these tools, maybe understanding a little bit about how APIs work, um, because that's only going to make your job of being a button creator you know, that much easier and prepare you for the future. So I think with Cloud Center, it makes that journey much, much easier. So um, it, I, it's, that's pretty great. Yeah, focus on the automating the application and less focus on automating 
the the traditional infrastructure needed for a common application, compute storage and, and networking. So you focus on the application and some of the ancillary things around like load balancers and other things, and you actually automate those pieces within the workflow, all while being very, very extensible, which is important. If you look, if you remember, Mark, you said something about you know APIs. One thing we there's a lot of uh, a lot of different OEMs out there that want to integrate with uh, um, with with Cloud Center and and want to want to uh, work with us WT on integrations with Cloud Center because you don't have to wait on Cisco to develop those integrations. The one thing we always ask them, and this is a very important question, do you have a REST API? Because <laughs> if they don't, they really have to make a case yep. on why we want to spend the time on some other API. Yeah. No, good call. Well, that, that was a fantastic demo. I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time and to, to join me on this episode right now. Um, I, I mean, great, the, the set of tools that you showed, the, the particular devices that you automated. But I think, I, I mean, I think if anyone was to take anything away from this, like you, you said it a couple of times there, Mark, it's it's be the be the button creator, not the button pusher. I mean, this this isn't a threat to your job as an engineer. I mean, this is this is the opportunity of actually being the champion within your organization of building out these integrations and, and supporting your APIs and presenting your infrastructure resources as APIs, as programmable infrastructure into these orchestration tools. Because it's helping the organization that's paying you be more successful and achieve things faster. I mean, it's it's win-win. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Bill Gates, you know, I hire lazy people because they find the most efficient way to do things or, or something along those lines. And it's it's absolutely true. So yep. to that, I would add to that if uh, uh, if you're if you're out there, you're an infrastructure engineer or you're you're kind of looking towards DevOps, that's real where the industry is actually gonna go. And I would say back in the day uh, when voice over IP first came out. Um, if you were that TDM phone operator or TDM phone engineer and you said, oh, voice over IP is a fad, you're probably laying brick right now. You probably had to make that uh, career move to probably a less acceptable career um, that from, a, <laughs> from, a, from a monetization and also a, a work-life uh, balance as well. So. Well, on, on that bombshell from um, from Joe, I think we'll, we'll call it an episode there. i, I got to say I agree with you, though, mate. Totally agree with you. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone again for coming to uh, to the latest episode. There, you've been listening to Mark Wall. Say goodbye, Mark. Bye. See everybody. And Joe Weber as well, both from WWT. See you guys. Great to talk with you both. And uh, yeah, that's another episode done. Thanks for listening. <laughs>